Going on. A warm welcome from Munich, my friends around the world, to our second webinar. Today we plan to do a webinar in cooperation with one of our partners, with the Tommen. It's about, in our opinion, the future of implant therapy. How did implant therapy develop in the last 20 years? What did change in the implant therapy in the last 10, 20 years? How did implant therapy change? And we call this concept, as you see here on the title, all in two. And I would like to start to go with you through a little bit historically, when we look to what is the topic today, when it comes to discussion about implant therapy, it's always about integration, how good implants integrate, how good we maintain the bone over time, do we have a stable situation long term, and different designs of the implant have an influence on the bone loss. So there are a lot of discussion about this issue. But, you know, most important is, in our opinion, what does a patient expect? So we need to ask the patient on the street, what do you want? What do you think is the problem with dental implants today? And this is the direction we should move on when it's about how can we improve implant therapy. We know so much, as I said, about integration, how to maintain bone, but the most important thing actually is what does the patient want? If we now, all together, we would go on the street in the city and ask the so-called Google educated patients, what are the problems? What are the problems with implants when it comes to dental implants? They give you a lot of answers. They will give you, when I put this on a, on a, when we discuss this together in a diagram, I would say, they would say, okay, does it work good? The function, I think all of them know that implants work pretty good. Implant works pretty good, so they know that today. Next point would be, what about aesthetics? How good are implants in aesthetic? If you would ask people, I would assume that people would say, yeah, aesthetically, we have also the feeling it seems to work pretty good. But now we come to the problem. What do you think patient would love? Patient don't think it's a good tool, why? I would say when it comes to morbidity. So we are not so good when it comes to morbidity. In the morbidity, or this wrong, morbidity, patient would say, it's painful. I heard from my friend, if you get dental implant, it's painful. You get anesthesia, maybe not only once, you get it several times. So it's a painful treatment. That's the first thing we should work on, because the patient expects something different. Then, I'm pretty sure, another answer, which is negative for implant therapy, would be, also not on a good level, the costs. So I'm pretty sure that many of your patients, or many people on the street would tell us, my experience, what I have heard, implants are very expensive, costs a lot, I cannot afford it. So there's another point, we should work on. 
We should look deeper in it. How can we solve this problem? And when it comes to the last point, well, I would assume that patient would not like it or would say, that's what I don't like about this treatment. And this is the time. So when we look at this diagram now, when we look at the oral health quality of life, this is the oral health quality of life, we see we are pretty good with function. Aesthetics, we are OK, I would say. But now we have a lot of issues we need to address. And we need to think, can we improve today with the hardware, with the software we have available, can we improve those problems here? Can we make it less painful? Can we reduce the cost? Or, and in addition, can we reduce the time? So there wouldn't be any advantage of a conventional prosthetic approach to the problem to close and edentulous areas, not preparing teeth, just place an implant if we would be time-wise in the same range. So that's what I want to discuss with you today. And I think, and I'm pretty much convinced, this is what we have to work on in implant therapy. And both of you, Otto and myself, believe strongly that this is the direction we have to move on. We have to do our research more and more to fulfill the requirements and requests from our patient in the future better. We don't do it now. We are not there yet. Well, we could be there if we really would pack our knowledge we have today better together. So how can we do that? I would like to share with you in a first, a first case. It's a first case, a simple case. And you know, when you look at this panoramic radiograph, the patient knows, actually he himself is a dentist, so he knows his problem. He has, as we go through his problem sites, he has in this area not so much bone. We can place an implant here, but we need some augmentation. Let's look on the other side. When we look at the other side here, we see there is a tooth, a tooth with an apically radiolucency. We have also in this area, anteriorly of this tooth, not so much bone here. So another problem. And a last problem area is down here in the lower. So if we would be able now to treat this patient today in two sessions, this would be the dream. This would solve all the problems we have today. Less sessions means less mobility. If you solve the problem in one session, maybe extraction, implant placement, taking an impression, everything in one session, and you just wait till the implants are integrated, and then you place the final crown, this would be two sessions. One in anesthesia, meaning less mobility. Time-wise, much faster. And the cost, for sure, you don't, I don't have to explain you that. If you see the patient only twice in your office to restore a situation like this, it's very, very cost effective. And right away, when you look at this situation, there are, no doubt, no doubt, a lot of questions which come to your mind. A lot of questions. Let's, let's look 
at a question catalog together. Let's have a look. What questions would you have to me right away when you see a case like this? You would have the first question, can we place an implant immediate? Immediate implant placement in a molar area, in a molar area, is this easy? Can this be done easily? Is this predictable? Is this a problem? Can we do it in a situation like we have in this case, where we have an apically big lesion? Apically, we have a lesion. You would say, no way. We cannot place an implant there right away. We have to extract the tooth, then we do rich preservation. We wait four or five months, and then we can place our implant. But doing this right away, we cannot do. Further question, can we do this only, for instance, if there is buccal bone? Is buccal bone absolutely necessary? Is this absolutely necessary to do this treatment, extraction, immediate implant placement? We have to have buccal bone, otherwise we cannot do that. So, initial question. A big question will be the hardware. The hardware, what is the best hardware? How can I achieve that? How can I place an implant immediately next to the socket? Are there better implants to do that? You know, I always get this typical question. When we give our master classes here in Munich, very often some participant come to me and say, tell me, which is for you the best implant system? Very often. I worked in my life over long, a long-term period now with different implant systems, about 15. I can tell you only one thing. This is a very, today for me, this question, 10 years ago, was a big problem for me. If somebody asked me, what is the best implant system, what is the best hardware to use in this difficult situation, I wouldn't have no an answer, honestly. Today, I know the answer, in our opinion, pretty perfect. The best implant system in the world is the implant system who makes your daily business as simple as possible. This is the best implant system. It's today a very easy answer for me. I can give you this right away. It must make your daily business as simple as possible. That's for me, today, the best implant system. Find it. What is the best implant system for you? There are clearly different requirements you must have. You need to have different components, simple components, simple working with this system. If it's too complicated, I wouldn't use it. Simple things, simplicity. That's what is clearly today needed for us as clinicians. The simpler, the better. We need an implant which has shown, for instance, that it does integrate incredibly fast. There are only a few implant systems available, actually only a couple, only two in my opinion, which have studies over three weeks. So if there is, like this situation, let's go back to the patient briefly. Here we have a situation, we have enough remaining bone, there's not a problem to place an implant. How long do we have to wait till we can load this implant here? There are a few implants who have done Studies showing us that you can load those implants already after three weeks. 
So this is something I look at as a clinician. If I have an implant system available, who allows me that, this is an advantage. I can be better regarding time. So we don't have to wait anymore. Like at the beginning, we were waiting three months in the lower, six months in the upper. This was in 1985, a clear, clear, not only a guideline, this was a rule at that time. Today, we have data already after three weeks. So hardware becomes crucial. To make this whole concept I want to share with you today, make it easy and simple for you, this is what you have to think about. So, what else would you ask me if we have those different situations we look at in this patient? Molar, so in which side we can place, we can place an implant immediately extraction socket the easiest. Today, the evidence is pretty clear. The recommendation is in the premolar area. Premolar area, this is simpler. In a molar area, it can become more difficult. There's no doubt. Can we achieve it? That's the issue. That's what you have to learn. And here I want to share with you some tricks later on. So, what else would you uh, assume to ask me if we, um, if you ask me when I look at the case here, it would be how long do I have to wait till I can place the suprastructure on it for the installation of the suprastructure. So how long? This depends a lot, as I already mentioned, on the hardware you use. If you have facts from your implant system that you don't have to wait so long anymore, we have literature there. Where to place the implant shoulder? Next question. When you have, when you place your implant into a extraction socket, implant shoulder positioning. So you see, when it comes to, uh, another thing would be, how do I take an impression at the same time when I expect to place an implant? And how do I transfer the soft tissue situation at the same time into the lab that the lab technician understands how he has to create, and this is another important issue, the emergence profile. The emergence profile of the future crown in this site. You need to help the lamp technician. You have to give him the information. That's the first thing. How can I transfer this information at the same time to the lab? In addition, how can you maintain, maintain the emergence profile over time? This is the next question. The emergence profile, the soft tissue situation over time till you place the final crown in there. So I think, I mean, there are questions for questions. And I'm pretty sure you have even more questions. So the question here we would write together becomes more and more. It is, and this is a very important phrase, a very important understanding. If what we are discussing here now is a simplifying of implant therapy for the patient. That's what we have as our goal. It's not, and this is very important to understand, it's not a simplifying of the implant therapy for you guys. For you guys, you have to have many, many things in your mind. How can you achieve the right emergence profile? How can you create the perfect mucosa around an implant? What is the perfect mucosa around an implant? 
the implant should, the, the mucosa around an implant should be attached. But not only that, it should also be keratinized, as we assume today pretty well. So, and it needs to have a certain thickness. So you need three things for the mucosa around implants. Thickness, not too thick. It shouldn't be too thick in the functional area. But also not too thin, different than around teeth. It should be attached, namely to the bone. And in addition, it seems to be better than when it's keratinized. So, so many things you have to think when you think about doing this in one session and have only a second appointment of your patient to place the final restoration. But how wonderful would this be for our patients? When indeed, not only for our patients, if we can achieve that, if we have all these thoughts in our mind and we can achieve that, it's also perfectly for you and your private practice. So let's go and look what we did in this patient. I just show you the situation one and a half hour later. This is the same patient one hour and 30 minutes later. What we did on this patient in this one and one hour and 30 minutes is, you see here, we extracted the tooth, we placed the implant, we did a little bit of internal sinus lift, we did implant placement here, we did also a little bit of internal sinus lift, here the lower was easy, was an easy approach, just opening the flap, dealing with the soft tissue and adding, and this is the important part, an individualized healing button. And on the other side, when we go to the other side, you can see here also we did implant placement, but the remaining bone was about 3-4 millimeter, and we did internal sinus lift. We created on each implant already, and you can see this here in the radiograph, an individualized healing abutment. So we create already the perfect emergence profile for the future crown. We take from this situation not only an impression of the implant position, but also an impression of the individualized healing abutment. So the, pay, the lab technician gets the information. And now the last thing, what you have to decide now, when you're finished with the treatment, because everything is done, taking out the tooth, implant placement, taking the impression, and the soft tissue is managed with indolized healing abutments, the last thing what you have to do is to decide when do we now load those implants. So when is the second time we are going to see the patient to install the final crown? Now here is clear. And we go here, down here, yes, this would be three weeks. This implant, you can place the final crown after three weeks. This is not a problem. This is evidence-based when you do that. Now in the upper jaw, it's getting a little bit more complicated. When we look on both sides, we have about three, four millimeter of remaining bone. So how long do we have to wait there? There you only have your own experience. So it depends on the hardware you use. What I'm telling you now here is with regard to the implant system we use. Every implant system is different. So be aware of that. Here, when I have four, five, four millimeter of remaining bone here, and I do three millimeter augmentation here, four millimeter is fine. So I can do the final crown on this implant after six weeks. This is my understanding from my software, the knowledge I have. And the same thing on the other side. I have four millimeter remaining bone. 
Six weeks. So after six weeks, the patient comes back. In between that, for sure, logical, we send all the data to the lab technician. And the lab technician creates for us the crowns. This is how a crown looks like. So no more abutments. It's clear. It's a one-piece superstructure. Monolithic ceramics, one-piece superstructure. So again, you don't need abutments. There is no abutment. It's a one-piece superstructure with a titanium base, as you see here. And you can screw this directly on the implant. Simple, easy, no cementation. You just screw off and let's have a look how the patient looked like here in the upper jaw on one side. This here you see, this is the idealized healing abutment. Patient comes back after six weeks. And now the good thing is when you use such an individualized healing abutment, you don't need any more anesthetize the area. Because now the tissue has already the shape of the crown. So you can screw off this healing abutment and you screw on your final restoration. How wonderful is that? This is for the patient exactly what they want. And believe me, at the end, it would be, or it is, in our opinion, it is also what you want. Because if you see the patient only twice, you have more time to treat other patients. Very simple. So everybody's happy. Patient is happy. You are happy. Everybody's happy in the team. And I understand, if you see this now, in this specific case, this is in our office daily business. This is nothing I just did two months ago, a case like this to share with you now. This is a concept we developed in the last eight years already. So we work on these concepts already since eight years and we make it better and better and better. We have only one thing in our mind and this is how can we make implant therapy better for the patient. I understand when you look now at this case presentation I just did, you say, crazy, this is not possible, I cannot do it. There are too many questions when we come back to our question uh, catalog. There are so many questions which I have. And am I, am I, do I have the skill to fulfill all these requirements? Do I have them? Can I do that? I understand that. This is what I said at the beginning. This webinar is impossible to share with you the whole concept in 45 minutes. This is not possible. This is really a concept you need to understand from the basics. It starts very low at the basics and then you can come better and better and you will be able. Today we are able to place implant, manage the soft tissue, meaning increasing the keratinized tissue, taking impression and finalize the case most of the time in one session and we just need a second one to place the final crown. So I have prepared for you a last case, a second case, where I want to share with you a little bit in a video that you see that this really works. One thing what we published and what I think some of you already have heard is this question. I want to address this question. Immediate placement of implants in the molar area. What is the problem there? In the literature it's clearly 
the recommendation, immediate implant placement in the premolar area is the easiest, is the best site to start with. Yes, no doubt. There it's the most simple approach. In the front, it becomes more demanding because of aesthetic reason, not because of creating stability. This can be solved pretty well in the front area too. But in the molar area, the major problem is, can we achieve, can we achieve with immediate implant in the molar area stability? That's stability, that's your major problem. And here, so excuse me, the stability, that's the problem. And here we published a paper with an idea, a very simple idea. And the idea is to help you um, to achieve that is you prepare your implant bed through the roots. That's a very simple idea. And I show you briefly a short video. So what you do normally when you have to extract the tooth, a molar, you don't take a forceps and extract the tooth. You remove the clinical crown on the level of the tissue. Then you remove, that's important, all composite, old root canal filling material, you remove completely out of the tooth. And now you go with your normal preparation ahead. So you use the same burr you use to prepare an implant bed and you prepare through the root. Once you have prepared through the root, your implant bed is finished, the preparation, and now you take out all the leftover of the roots. What is the advantage of that? What is the big advantage of that? The big advantage of that is that you are able now with this approach to maintain the septus. The septa. When I go back at the beginning of my, here is a good example. It's a wonderful example. This is an upper jaw and you see what we did? We prepared our implant bed through the roots in the middle of the tooth <coughs> Excuse me, and after that, we removed the roots. And now look what we achieved. Look at this small, thin, very thin septas which allow you to place your implant even in an area where you have only two, three millimeter of remaining bone height and the sinus starts at the top. So let me go briefly, uh, we already shared this, we go back to the next case. I want to share with you a last case, as I said. And this is the situation. So we had a long discussion with this patient about these two molar, if we are going to do root canal treatment and then period treatment with root resection because he has a vocation class three on both molar. So the plan was either maintaining teeth and do root resective procedure with root canal treatment or extract and place implant and the patient decided to go with extraction and implant placement. So let me share with you, now I need briefly, can I get this? Yeah. Okay, we have, uh, I go a little bit aside, I can control it a little bit here from my computer. So you see the situation, we removed first, or we remove first the clinical crown, then we take uh, digital impression of the emergence profile. You have seen this, you have seen the camera there. And now we do a cycle incision around the teeth to make sure that we maintain the tissue as good as we can. Before we start now to prepare the implant bed through the root. We have to make a brief changing here, my friend. Uh, Weißt du, wie man dazu, ich muss, ich muss den Film bearbeiten können und jetzt sind wir im anderen Mut. Da musst du, 
Da musst du zurückgehen und dann nicht, damit ich in den Film. So, we have to make a short uh, change on the film that I can work on the film, but briefly, but the idea is clear. We now start to prepare the implant bed through the root, till to the flow of the sinus. So yes, here you need a lot of experience, feeling, analysis, radiographically analysis. How deep can you prepare? You have to do that, because otherwise you pour into the sinus and then you cannot do the treatment. So you have to be aware from the beginning, this is the situation, I will be close to the sinus, I need to do, besides extraction, immediate implant placement, also an internal sinus lift. And then the test question is only, do we have to use some augmentation material, yes or no? You have to go in the system. In the system. Yeah, okay, okay, we are there, good. Thank you, we are there. And we go back to the film. So here we are back and I can now control the film better. And so we don't have to, oh, now we are too far. What did you do? Oh, yeah, yeah, he made a mistake, my friend. What had, no, sorry, what did you do? I'm sorry, okay, we come back in a second, I'm right away there. Okay, so. So now we prepare our Let's go, now I can go through. Now, we see that. We go now and prepare our implant bed through the root. We check if we don't go through the sinus, if we still maintain a little bit of bone at the top, we maintain a little bit of bone, and we take the next spur. And the next spur, so we prepare the implant bed through the roots. We maintain the root completely. This is now the third burr. We plan to place a five millimeter implant. So this is the next burr. And we go close to the flow of the sinus. This is, everybody knows how to do an implant placement with an internal sinus lift. It's the same thing. Always check with a probe if you don't perforate the sinus. And now you separate with a thin burr the roots and then you take out the roots. Now we take out with a, this is a very nice elevator, a very small, tiny little small elevator where you mobilize the root, every root, and then you take those roots out. Piece for piece, at the end you take them out so this was the parallel root, and now we take out the mesial buccal root. So we take those roots carefully out after finalizing the preparation of the implant bed. And now, once we have done that, then we do the internal sinus lift. Here, it seems that I need to go a little bit deeper. I can see now with my loop and light exactly where is the flow of the sinus. Now I see better. And sometimes I have to make a little bit correction. I go a little bit deeper with the burrs again. And then I take the internal sinus lift. Look at this picture now. Now you can see how tiny little septas are there, allowing me, you see now the flow of the sinus. And now I can elevate the sinus internally. And for that you need parallel wall. Osteotomes, you check again with your probe and now you elevate internally the sinus. And now it depends how high you go to elevate the sinus. Look at this picture, beautiful. You can see everything. You see down there deep, you see that the membrane is intact and now you decide, do I need material, yes or no? And you can do the next one. And uh, we don't have to do that. We go a little bit faster through the same thing. And then we place our implants. After placing the implants, we now take the final impression already. 
we have scanned bodies on it digitally. The digital impression was already taken before I start the surgery. And now we take the fine impression and what is next? Next is, I only want to share this with you, how to support the soft tissue in the right position. We create individualized abutment, chair side, and polish them in the lab, and then we are finished. This is the same situation of this patient three months later. So, three months later, the patient comes back and he was with us for one session. Extraction, immediate implant placement with sinus lift, taking impression, supporting the tissue with individualized abutment, and the lab technician has already prepared final crowns. One piece, patient comes in after three months and gets the final crown installed. So how wonderful is that? We see the patient here twice for a rather difficult situation. And here the radiographic situation with the sinus lift on both sides. This is, in our opinion, the future. This is the future of implant therapy. And when I come back to my diagram, you remember the diagram I draw at the beginning with you? Why I put question marks? We are good here in function. We are pretty good in aesthetics, the patient accepted. But now, look, what is happening now? We are much better with morbidity. We only need to anesthetize once today. We are much better with costs. We see the patient less. We don't have to anesthetize twice or three times. We don't have to use abutments. We don't need to ask or any company to create us cat cap abutments. We don't need that. It's not necessary. And the time, you know, a case like you just have seen. Let's go through this case. Let's go through this case, what we have done 10, 15 years ago. We extract the teeth, we wait three, four months, then we do a sinus lift, and maybe we do at the same time implant placement, we wait another four months or five months. Then we uncover the implants. We wait another two months. And then we take an impression, and then we install, maybe we do some cat cam abutments dry in, and then we screw the abutments on, and then we cement the crown. In between, we have another dry in, so it means about, whatever you want to say, six, eight sessions till you are finished. That's the normal way. In our opinion, that's the conventional way. We need to do everything what we can do to come back to this drawing or to this diagram that we help our patients with morbidity, costs, and time. And believe me, my dear friends, this is today possible. It is possible. It is not easy, I know that. Uh, to present this concept in 45 minutes, 30, 50 minutes, I know it's almost impossible because this concept includes so many details to understand the whole concept. So yes, it's a good idea to come to us, to listen to our master classes. There we share all tricks, all these tricks. I put now together for you in this puzzle, just to share with you what is the idea behind it. And to give you one trick, and I think this is already a great trick, namely preparation through the root is a wonderful idea. It's going to help you tremendously to achieve in difficult situation, namely the molar area, also prime stability of your implants. Try it.
and you will see many, many of our friends who have heard about it, they try it, they do it, and they are very happy about it. So I'm sure we have, again, a lot of questions. I try to answer some of the questions. My team behind me is working very hard to put the questions together. And now we have uh, my assistant professor who is going to ask the question. Hopefully we understand it this time better. Or maybe I repeat the questions. So what is the questions the participant had? Yes, yes, so we so have we a have question, question about, about the limitations. limitations. If you have a periapical lesion, like a periapical inflammation, do we have yes, limitations when you place the implant regarding maybe stability or the infection itself? So uh, it's the question about apical lesion. Always the same question. You have seen the first case I showed you was a big apical lesion. The first thing, an apical lesion, when it's big, can make problem with primary stability, there's no doubt about that. The second question is the inflammation. Is this a problem? You know, there is so much literature today, evidence about this issue, meta-analysis, and also our internal evidence. You can place implants immediately in extraction socket if they have also apical lesions. This works. Specifically, and this is now a tip I give you, if the patient, this is our decision, this is not based on science, what I'm telling you now, this is how we decide to do it, if the patient has no pain on this tooth and has a big apical lesion, doesn't matter. We take the tooth out and we place an implant. The infection can be nicely taken out because this situation is a chronicle inflammation and this is the case where you go down with your curette, with your bone curette and remove the granulation tissue most of the time in one piece and there you are really safe. Or another example is the fistula. Fistula is a good tooth for immediate implant placement because there you're sure that the inflammation is not inside the bone, it goes out. So fistula is a tooth, and most of the time, a tooth with a fistula has no pain. So there you also can immediately place an implant. But I agree with some of you, maybe that's why you asked the question. The bigger the lesion is apically, it does decrease your possibility to stabilize the implant in the extraction socket. So another question, um, couldn't the immediate, no, couldn't the loading after three weeks um, jeopardize the secondary physiologic stability? Is this a problem because you have too early force in the implant after three weeks already and this could repair that as well iteration? Absolutely, absolutely right. This comment, if you load implants too early, you can jeopardize the integration and you can lose the implant. This is what I said at the beginning. You have to find your hardware you strongly believe into. That's it. There is hardware who have shown that it's possible to load implants in remaining bone already after three weeks. So there is evidence about that. If you don't want to take this risk and you think your patient has no problem if he waits another two months, go ahead and do it. I just showed you the future. We are doing this now, as I said, already since eight years. We are trying to reduce the time because our patients don't want to wait so long. But if you want to be safe, Wait longer, that's not a problem. Find the trust in your hardware. You have to find the trust in your hardware. This is what you have to do. And I will not say you have to use this or that. This is not what I'm going to do. You have to find out yourself. Other question, please. Yes, um, so what's the primary stability of the maxillary implant? In this case, we had a question. How much stability do you need? This is also uh, an interesting question. Thanks a lot for this question. Again, 
You know, there are some, I would say, for me it's rumor or for me it's dogmas in implant therapy. People are telling you, you have to have a torque. You measure your primary stability with the torque. Today, fortunately, we start to differentiate between the so-called insertion torque, so the last, last five, six turns you measure, and the so-called final torque. So you know the final torque when the implant shoulder goes into the bone, the cortical bone, and then it's stable. And the torque increases a lot. This is very often in the lower jaw, where you have cortical bone at the top. This you should not do. This is not good for this cortical bone. That's another thing. I don't want to discuss this with you. But this is this measurement and recommendation or dogmas which are there out in implant therapy are, in our opinion, a big problem. Because it's obviously today, very obviously, every implant system you use needs another torque. If I'm going now to tell you the torque of my implant here was 50 Newton centimeter. You say, are you crazy? This is impossible to do an open healing. Depending on the implant system you use. Clearly, clearly big difference. There are implant systems, if you have a torque of 50 Newton centimeters, you cannot do an open healing. And you know that. This implant system I'm using allows me even with 10, 12 Newton centimeter insertion torque, I speak about the insertion torque, not the final torque, I can do an open healing. So, it is very dangerous to say on the stage, you need to have a torque of 40, 50, 60 Newton centimeter, then you can do an immediate loading. This is very popular. No, it depends on the implant system you use. And there are implant systems out where a torque of 25 Newton centimeter is enough to do an immediate loading. So this question, how stable my implant must be, is a question nobody can answer to you. This is something you need to feel. That's what I always teach to our participant in our master class. Don't forget, bone is connective tissue. It's just mineralized connective tissue. You have, as an implantologist, you have to feel, to smell, and to see your bone quality. Feeling, smelling, and seeing. That's what you have to do. Then you understand what quality of bone I really have available there. And then you measure for you, okay, this is stability. Then you decide the time point when I go to load those implants. So after every implant placement surgery, I tell my dental assistant when I do this treatment all in two, this patient comes back after six weeks, after eight weeks, after four weeks for the final installation. This is from each patient to the other one different. And this is what I mean. You have to think biological. Bone is not mechanics. Bone is biology. And strongly believe in them, my friend. Learn to smell the bone, to feel the bone, and to see the bone, and to understand the bone. This is what you have to do. Every implantologist in the world need to do that. Other questions, maybe? Uh, yes, uh, yes, one more. We have, well, we actually have a lot more, but... Um, a lot of more yeah. questions, but yeah, this is clear. <laughs> this is what's clear. This uh, topic will create a lot of questions. This is normally, uh, because it is really something different, but it is 
the future. Um, maybe we have this one. Um, you said you did an internal sinus lift and you had like three millimeter, four millimeter of remaining bone. Do you have a rule for when you use, when you can still go for an internal sinus lift or when you go for external? Good question. It's always, also this question I very often get. Uh, do we have a rule? When do we do internal sinus lift? When do we do lateral sinus lift? If it's two millimeter, three millimeter, how much remaining bone we need to have, then we decide to go lateral or we go internal. Uh, actually, no, I have no rule. Sometimes I do an internal sinus lift with one millimeter bone. It works, but it's very time consuming. So if I have a patient, for instance, a patient they have medically, let's put this today, we have all these bone bisphosphonate patients. When you have a bisphosphonate patient, you cannot do a big flap and denude the bone. In such a situation, if the patient really wants from you an implant, then you have to do internal sinus lift. Then you have to take the time to do it. Another thing which is very important, and we always teach in this direction, if you do an internal sinus lift, you must be able to perform an external sinus lift. Absolutely mandatory. Because with the loops which we have today and the light on it, we can control today the membrane. And we use mainly five millimeter implants, so the access hole is bigger, so we can control the membrane with an internal size much more, much better than in the past. We see what we do through the access hole, and so when it happens that I perforate, I can open a flap, go from the side, I must be able to do that. That's my recommendation. If you first decide, okay, in this case I do internal, try to do it, if you are successful, better for the patient, even less pain, that's no doubt. But also today, with the external, we can be much better regarding mobility, but it's a little bit more, for sure, painful. But you must be able to manage complication in such a situation. That's the recommendation from our side. So now, I'm sorry, it's one hour over. I want to thank you, all our friends around the world, that you spent one hour with us sharing, I hope I shared something hot for you, future. We do things first here for a long time, five, six years, before we go out and tell the people what we do. But we strongly believe that this concept has a big future because this is what our patient want from us. Thank you. Bye-bye.